Okay, I'll get everybody seated. Let's pray and we'll get started. Dear Lord, we thank you for this conference. We, I thank you for all the great things I've heard people teach on. And I thank you for these ladies and the spirit that's in this room. I ask right now that you would be with me and, <clears throat> Lord, give me a, a clear mind. Um, give me a compassionate heart. And give me wisdom as I speak on this subject that um, I would be a help and not a hurt to anyone. <clears throat> and that ladies would be informed and would be challenged and encouraged to do what you want them to do in this area. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I need some water. Just right, Kathy, under the. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you today on don't drink the water, because I just needed water. <laughs> um, recently, this last year, we had a couple's retreat, and we, had, we went on a cruise for a couple's retreat. How many of you went on that cruise? Wasn't that a fun couple's retreat? That was just a great time. But that's the first time I had ever been um, to Mexico. I live, what, two hours from the Mexican border, and I've never been to Mexico. And um, there's a very important thing to remember when you go to Mexico. Don't drink the water. The water, and then my husband went to the Philippines last year, and, and we're taking a big group of college age and high school and adults to the Philippines this summer. And one of the things you have to remember there is don't drink the water. You don't even brush your teeth with the water. My husband said he, would, he was having the hardest time remembering not to use the faucet. He would go into the bathroom, put a washcloth over the faucet, and take a bottle of water and put it on the, on the sink so he wouldn't forget to rinse his toothbrush in the water. Well, what has happened in these countries is God made this pure, fresh um, water, and it's become polluted and it's become contaminated. What was once a pure, refreshing creation of God has been contaminated to the point that it can no longer refresh and it can no longer satisfy those who it was created for. And um, today I'm going to talk about don't drink the water. I have two... If I could get two... Um, Esther and Chris, I come up here. <clears throat> Do you know, we, like this water, live in a dirty world. And it's very easy for us to become polluted. Um, today, I, I, what this topic is on is about being pure. And you know, we need to be pure in our words, we need to be pure in our actions. And we need to be pure in our appearance. Those are the three areas the devil tries to hurt our purity. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, <clears throat> because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh about, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Um, we have an enemy, and he would love to ruin our purity. He would love to destroy us. Do you know, the devil um, is likened to a lion in this verse. But in Genesis, what was the, the creature that he was likened to? A serpent. So we have here <laughs> the devil. And he had a little talk with Eve. Because what did he want to do? He wanted to devour her. He wanted to get her to do what God did not want her to do. So that God could, she would lose fellowship with God and God could not use her. Well, I'm going to tell you some stories about some ladies who Satan spent some time talking to. Now, I very carefully chose these stories um, my husband and I know a lot of stories, unfortunately more than we wish we knew, about ladies and men who have lost their purity. 
Now, we ch I chose these stories because I, I know that no one in here knows about these situations. So if I, as I tell the story, you think, ah, oh, I know who that is. Um, you don't. But Satan is the same, he uses the same methods. And so you probably know a similar story. So that's why it's going to sound familiar to you. So don't think as you're listening, oh, I didn't know that detail about it. It's because it's not the same story. Okay, I know how ladies think, so I'm trying to get you primed here for this, for these illustrations. And you know, as I tell these stories, I do not tell these stories um, with condemnation. These are ladies that I love. And these are ladies that Satan deceived. And their lives have been destroyed. And I don't mean they can't ever rebuild, but the pain and the heartache that they've gone through because of these situations has been devastating to, to them and to other people. Um, but why, why do we as ladies lose our purity? Now let me talk to married ladies just for a minute. Why would a married lady become unfaithful and lose her purity in her marriage? Um, let me tell you this one story. One of the reasons is because of bitterness. Um, I'm going to tell you the story as it was told to me. I became very bitter with my husband. I could not accept the relationship he offered me. He would say he loved me, but when I would frustrate him, he would say unkind things to me. I would then harbor the hurt that those words created. I did not have a very good self-image as it was, so my husband's thoughtless words caused me to feel even more even worse about myself. I became very judgmental of my husband's weaknesses and would compare him to other men. This caused me to feel sorry for myself. I felt unloved and unappreciated. My bitterness gave place to anger, and I decided I had been hurt long enough. I thought that if I could hurt my husband, he would understand what it felt like to be hurt by the one that was supposed to love you. The thing that I thought would hurt him the most was to be unfaithful. So I spent the night with a man and told my husband about it. Well, the plan did not work. Instead of destroying my husband as planned, he forgave me and wanted to work on our relationship. Now I felt even more guilt and more negative about myself than ever. I still blame my husband for all my unhappiness. Again, I decided to be unfaithful, and the man I chose the second time was a respected married man in the church. It took me a long time to coax him into sleeping with me. In the process, I fell in love with him. His name is Tom. It's not really, but I'm going to give him that name. So if you know any Toms, I'm not talking about him. <laughs> Tom soon became very convicted of our sin. He ended the relationship and confessed all to his wife and asked her forgiveness. He realized that he did, not, he did love his wife. I was devastated. My plan to hurt my husband had backfired. This lady lost her husband. She lost her church. She doesn't attend church anymore. Her children, who had known nothing but Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Christian school, aren't in church anymore. And the, her older ones are living very immoral lives. But the devil used bitterness to get this lady to make some foolish decisions. So what happened is because of bitterness, the water got polluted. Let me tell you another story. Insecurity is another thing that the devil uses. I was married to a very successful husband. He was good at everything except making me feel special. I felt he was always just a little disappointed in me. I felt that I could not quite meet up to what he expected me to be as a pastor's wife. This is a pastor's wife. I did not have a real close walk with God, and the, per and the pressure that I felt from my husband caused a lot of resentment. I resented the time he gave to the people in the church. I resented the lack of money for nicer things. I resented the life that my husband had provided for me. It was during this time that I met Sam, who was very kind and sympathetic toward my heart heartache. I started spending time with Sam just to talk things over. It seemed to help, I thought. It wasn't long before deeper feelings started developing for him. Sam seemed to worship the ground I walked on. I really did not care if I hurt my husband. I wanted him to know that he wasn't as perfect as he thought he was. I wanted him to know that what a lousy husband he was to me. I was almost glad when my husband found out about my affair. The only problem I had was my love for my children. 
I did not want to hurt my children. I did end the affair, and my husband and I are still together, but the guilt, the mistrust, the hurt that lies between us are still problems that we must fight to overcome. Satan used insecurity in this lady's life to tempt her to become impure. The last story I'm going to tell you is about unfulfilled expectations. Now, this wife's husband had had several affairs with different ladies when she came to me, and this is her story. I met Bill at church while still married to my first husband. He was so good-looking and so fun. He always took time to greet me and say kind things to me. I was very bored in my marriage. My husband was so predictable, so scheduled, so boring. Bill always made me feel special. I would go out of my way to run into him whenever I saw that his wife was not with him. We started meeting for lunch while our spouses were at work. He told me how unhappy he was in his marriage. I could not believe that his wife did not appreciate what a great husband she had. He, we started feeling guilty about our affair. Yes, it turned into more than just meeting for lunch. We divorced our spouses and got married, bringing several children from both sides into the picture. My ex-husband was devastated. He dropped out of church and began drinking. I quit letting my children see their father because of the drinking. By the, by the way, he was a good father. He dearly loved his children, and they loved him. I tried to make them think of Bill as their father. Bill had very little interest in children, and after several years I found that he had very little interest in me. I noticed at church he showed great interest in all the other ladies. I feel that I ruined a perfectly good man and hurt my children greatly with my impurity. I wish I could do it all over again. Bill had had four affairs that she knew of with different women in the 15 years that she had been married to him. Boredom, unfulfilled expectations, is what Satan used to, to get this lady to make great mistakes in her moral life. Now, I know there are, th there are three types of ladies that I'm speaking to in this room tonight, or today. Um, those who have been listening to Satan and they have, they're, they've given in or they're just about ready to give in and become another illustration of impurity. Then there's the lady in here, those who are not tempted yourself to become impure. Maybe you have a strong marriage, but because of your indiscreet way of talking or acting or looking, your example is influencing other ladies to follow you, and they are in danger of losing their purity. And then there's the third lady in here who you're going to agree with everything, and this is the majority, I believe, of the ladies in this room. You're going to believe and agree with everything that I'm going to say, but you just need to be reminded maybe one more time of how important it is that we use discretion in our words, in our actions, and in our appearance. So my lesson today is... What do you want? I should have been a put in the sky. I say I'm, I'm terrible with visual aids. I think I'm up and I never use them. If I offered you a drink of water, which picture would you choose? And you say, Mrs. Goddard, this is already me. Do you know God could do wonderful things? Let's stop letting this, let's make, let's stop this. And let's let this be our life from now on. Some of you may still have this. Hang on to it for all you're worth. I'm going to talk to you. Sit these down. You go, go, go. That guy is heavy. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today on how to protect yourself and others from becoming impure. Proverbs 22.3 says, a, pr a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself from it. Hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Knowing the danger is the most important thing. I'm going to talk about how to have a gracious reserve with men. Mrs. Hiles taught me this when I was in college, and I think it's in one of um, Pattern for Living book, possibly. It's in that book. And um, so some of these points are from that. Some of them I learned from someone else. But number one, is maintain a safe distance between you and the man when you're talking to him. 
If you're talking to a man, you're married, he's married, well, any man, this would go for any man. Um, you know what my distance is? Arm's length. That's how far I will stand, close I will stand to a man when I speak with him. Once I get any closer, I feel like it's too close. So arm's length is, is, is a, you know, I'm not saying it's in the Bible. I mean, if you get closer than, if it's one finger and, you know. But, but that's a good, safe principle. You should have a principle for how close you will stand to a man when you talk to him. I was, I taught this at um, pastor school. I have never taught a, a lesson that I had so much, so many comments about as this, se- this session. I was really surprised. But a pastor's wife, after I taught this. I guess we, my husband and I were together and we greeted a pastor and his wife and the wife had been in my session and her, and her husband, um, we, I shook hands with them and, and she noticed that when um, I was talking to her husband I had just taken a step back. Well, then her husband took a step forward, and um, the lady knew what I was doing. She, she, I, and I don't even remember this, so I not, I don't condemn people that stand closer than one arm, you know, ladies. I didn't think, oh, this man is being forward. I didn't. I just a, a habit that I have, and she thought that was so hilarious. She told me later, you know, when you took a step back, my husband took a step forward, and then you took a step back, <laughs> and I don't, I don't remember that happening. But that it is a good, safe thing to do. And number two, keep conversation short and to the point. Um, this, is main, this is mainly if you are married or the man you're talking to is married. And it, I don't mean your husband, but, you know, somebody else. <laughs> we don't need to be having long conversations with someone else's husband. And if we're married, we don't need to have, be having long conversations with a single man. There was a, many, many years ago, there was a man who attended our church, and he was always around me. He was always wanting to have these conversations with me. And I don't have conversations with men. My husband can counsel men and talk with men. I got, look at all these ladies. What do I need to do with a man? You know, I don't need to talk to men. And um, everywhere, it seemed like he was always there, always asking me questions, things that I just didn't feel I had any. So... I didn't know what to do about this guy, so I just started avoiding him. And one day when I was home by myself, he knocked on our door. Now you knew I was, he knew I was home by myself because we didn't have a garage, so the car wasn't there, and we only had one car. I think that was the days we didn't have a car, the church had, you know, that we borrowed a car from the church, but there was no vehicle there. He knocked on my door and he said, um, uh, I need your help. He said, I've become very attracted to a lady in the church, and I, I know she feels the same way about me, and I need to know what I should do about it. Um, and I know it's not right because I'm married. And I'm thinking, this is not good. And I looked at him, and I thought, I've got to do something here. Because this guy's dense. He's not getting the message. I looked at him, and I said, sir... Don't ever knock on my door again when my husband is not home. And I closed the door. I didn't have any more problems with that man. But, you know, we are not to to spend our time helping men in our church. We're not to spend our time having long conversations. Use courteous tone of voice when you speak with them. And um, make sure it doesn't, the man you're talking to doesn't feel like you enjoy talking to him more than anybody else in the world. Um, don't let conversations become familiar or suggestive. I'm amazed at how indiscreet our world is and how, what people will talk about. You know, um, even in, in an unsaved home, I was right up, you don't talk about body parts. You don't mention things like that. You don't talk about body functions. You, there are just certain things, especially ladies. Ladies don't say certain words. But no, it's, um, it's good when you're talking with... Um, a married man or you're a married lady talking to a single man, it's good to make sure that you don't express strong feelings about things. For instance, the preacher preaches a great sermon. You could do it to one or two ways. Preacher, your sermon made me feel so loved. You are such an awesome man. When I am down and lonely, I just stop and think of you, and it makes me feel so cared about and so secure. I just don't know what I would do without you. Or, 
Or you could say, Preacher, God really speaks to my heart when you preach. Thank you for being so faithful to Him. Discretion. And you really better do it if you go to Faith Baptist Church. You know, it's not, you don't need to sit around with a, a, a man and, and share dreams. Now, if you're dating, some of this isn't going to apply. Some of it does, but I'm talking about improper, you're, you know, I don't want to keep saying that, so you know what I mean, right? Okay, no sharing dreams. Do you know, I'm not going to sit around with uh, one of the men on our staff and share, oh, you know, I have this dream. I really, you know, and talk about things I like and, oh, you like, oh, I like that too. We are so, so much in common. You know, that is not good. Um, don't talk about appearance. You know, I don't need to be saying, oh, what do you think of my nails? Do you think they turned out okay this time? Or, you know, do, do you like this haircut? Or, um, you know, this, this outfit's getting kind of tight, you know. <laughs> Discretion when you're talking to men. Um, there was a man in our church. Uh, this is a different man, but um, <laughs> I don't really attract these men. They just—I've been here 25 years. A lot of things happen. But um, I had lost a little bit of weight, and he came up to him and he said, "Mrs. Goddard, you look like you've lost some weight." He says, you look really, oh, he, he said, you look really good. You look like you've lost some weight. That is not discreet, ladies. I was not flattered. That's worried me. Do you know what? I didn't even comment. I said, how's your wife? How are your kids doing? We weren't going there. And then I quickly got an answer and, and departed from his company. But, you know, I don't know that that man really meant anything wrong, but he is in danger. Because he is indiscreet, and he is not conducting himself properly. And I'm not hanging around a man that's like that. Maintain good posture when talking with men. Do you know the way you stand can say, I want you to notice my body? Just by the way you stand. Um, when greeting a married couple, always greet the wife first. Always. You go up to a married couple, and you know you tend to greet the most outgoing one first. And sometimes that could be the man. But you should make it a point to greet the man, the wife, first. Um, never ride alone in a car with a man. That's another one. Never ride alone in a car with a man. Um, just don't ride alone in a car with a man. That's really not that hard to do, ladies. Um, my husband at times, he will not ride alone. If he sees a lady broke down on the side of the road, maybe one of our church ladies, he has stopped given him his car, her his car, said, go get help, and I will stay here. But he will not take her. He might call, stop and call on his phone and get help for her and stay until someone comes, um, sit in his car and wait till someone comes. But he's not taking her. Um, never ride alone in a car with men. Never compliment a man about his appearance. Do you know men don't really need to think that you are aware of their body? You could, you could compliment a man about something God did through him. Um, there's, there's ways to be kind and gracious to men, but they really don't need you to say anything about their appearance. You know, wow, that's a sharp, you know, you know now if it's a little guy, yeah, you could do that with little guys. But, but your peers, it's really important. They don't, they don't think about, you don't want to flatter. You know, the Bible talks about the Proverbs, um, the strange woman as being a flatterer flattering with her words. Don't touch other than a handshake. Now, some of you ladies are more huggy. Don't huggy on men. Hug all the women. Get all your needs out on all the women. And you know, this is hard for me with our college boys. I mean, I, I was in the nursery with them. I changed their diapers and they were at college. And when they, when they come home from college, I really would like to hug them because they're just, to me, little boys. But I'm not hugging our college guys. They're young men. That would be very indiscreet. And so, shake hands. When writing, always include their wife or their husband in the note. Let's say I need to write our school principal, Brother Bill. Um... Maybe I want to thank him for something he did for one of my children. I would say, Dear Brother Bill, thank you for encouraging my son. Um, the words you gave him were, were very, you know, whatever. You encouraged him. Thank you for doing that. Your wife 
I just love her. She's, you know, you and your wife are such a blessing to me and my husband. See the discretion there? So you can write to them, but use your husband's name or use their wife's name in the letter. Um, Don't dress in a way that would make a man think that you want him to notice your body. Now this is a session, this is the second half of this session. Um, I don't remember when I'm supposed to stop here. I make the schedule. I guess I could stop whenever I want. No, I better not. (laughs) 12.45. Oh, good. Perfect. Okay, we're going to... I don't know how I'm going to do this. If we can get the front half of the auditorium lights off and pull that screen down and see what we can see. Does this need to be moved? Could someone help me move this? It just has to get out of the way of that. Like. There. Oops. Guess I better not use that. Can you hear? Can. It's uh, blue. Can you. Oh, wow. Well, you can <laughs> blind as it is, now I'm going to do this in the dark. This is silly, isn't it? We need to, our last point is, let's not dress in a way that would make a man think we want him to notice our body. And I'm going to talk about four things that cause a man to notice your body. Ladies, these are things that any man would agree with. I didn't make this up. Any man, and if you're a married lady, you would agree with it. You know. You young girls, you don't know anything, so you just got to trust us. <laughs> but the first thing that we, um, the first way that we could dress that makes the man think we would like him to notice our body is when we wear things that are too low. So let's look at a too low. That was probably a little too low. We're all women here, so don't get too, too worried here. Um, That's an obvious too low. But let's go to the next one. Now, this is a fairly attractive dress. It's pretty modest. But do you see how low the neckline is there? When we wear a neckline that's that low, it's like an arrow. Do you see the shape of it? And it points to our bust line. And it it says, uh, look at my bust line. A man thinks that when you wear a, a... A lady wears a dress like that. She is saying, I would really like you to notice my bust line. Um, Then, what's the next one? Those are two more, the little straps, all that flesh that shows on top. These are, these are blouses, or these are dresses, aren't they? These are dresses that would say to a man that you would like him to notice your shoulders, your bust line, everything in that area. Next. Okay, this is not in front. This is in back. Do you know it could be too low in back also? Do you know if a man, if you're wearing that in church and a man's sitting behind you, and he's looking at that pretty neck of yours, and that bare back of yours. Do you know how hard it is for him to concentrate on what the preacher's saying? I, ladies, th- we're, we're just being honest here. See, Christian ladies want to put their head in the sand like an ostrich and say, Oh no. But, but men are turned on by what they see. Um, next. This is also too low, too short, too everything wrong. (laughs) Uh, I think this lady, her posture isn't quite right. I think a man would probably say she probably wants him to notice her body. Now, she may not be standing that way or dressing that way for that purpose. But that is the consequences. That is what's going to happen if she decides to dress that way. Because men love a lady's legs. How many of you are married? How could you not agree with this? 
men, men love to see. A, do you know a lady's body is the most beautiful thing in the world to a man, and he should be able to see his wife's all he wants. But I don't really want you showing yours to my husband. Mine is the only one. And your husband, yours should be the only one. Nobody else's husband needs to see how beautiful you are. Next. <clears throat> now this is too tight. So too low was the first one. Too tight is the next one. This is the hardest one. This is the one probably we as Christian women may violate more than the others because there's no flesh showing. So we don't think about the form. But do you see on her blouse the shadow there? Do you see how because of the, the cut, how tight the blouse is, how it cups under and it cups around? That's a blouse that says to a man, oh, look at my bust line. It's a blouse that shows a man exactly how big your bust line is. Um, what's the next one? Now this is a too low and too tight. And this has a few gathers. And this is too sheer, too. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but this was a mannequin with nothing under the blouse. And you know how they make them realistic? And that's what this was like. And so, this is definitely a wow, look at my bust line blouse. What's the next one? This is another style. Of course, this is too low. And then, do you see how they put all those gathers there at the bust line? That's an attention getter. You know, they put all that right there. And this is definitely a too tight. Um, okay, go to the next one. Now these are too, too tight, too low. All these form-fitting blouses. Now, you know, I feel sorry for especially our young girls. Um, our young girls are going to the mall, and they're seeing all these mannequins with clothes stretched on them. And the style is very form-fitting right now. Everything is very stretched to them. So the girls think when they buy these clothes, they, they need to look like that. Because that's what the world wants them to look like. And I'll talk about that in just a minute when we're done with this. Go to the next one. Okay, here's a different kind of too tight. Do you think a man may be a little attracted to a lady's behind? Let me ask you something. You ladies, when you go to a store and you see something really pretty, what do you want to do? Touch it, don't you? <laughs> you do. You see something really pretty and you want to, if you see something soft, what do you want to do? You, you want to touch it? If you see something pretty, you want to pick it up? You know those signs that say, do not touch it. It's like, well, why even go to the store? Because you, you experience it more by touching it. You, if it's attractive, if you see, you see a candle, what do you want to do? You want to smell it. There's more than just see. When a man sees that, you know what he wants to do? <laughs> it's an invitation. He's not thinking about, look at that godly lady. I bet she loves God. Now this is not a lady, it's a mannequin. I go to the next one. Now here's another very tight. Everything that girl has on is, is skin tight. It's a look at my bust line, look at my hip line, look at um, all my lines. <laughs> What's the next one? Now this is too short and too low. This is a, an outfit that would say, look at my bust line, look at my legs. Okay, next one. Now this is just weird, <laughs> you know. <laughs> also immodest. Um, it's too tight. Um, it's not too low. She did good there. Give her A plus on that one. Then that's a skirt that she has on. And with green tights. The tights make it, see your legs don't show so I guess the tights make it okay. I don't know. Um, that's just weird. But that's an example of too short, too tight. That's the next one. And that's too short. It's kind of a scary mannequin there. Okay. That's just ugly, but it's too short, too. <laughs> I don't know who in their right mind would wear that. You'd look 300 pounds no matter what size you were. Okay, go to the next one. <laughs> now, this is too sheer. That's another thing sometimes we forget to pay attention to. Do you know when a man could stand behind you and go, 32B, um, you're, you're probably too sheer. Uh, 
Oh, she's wearing a pink one today, you know? Or you could tell whether you're wearing bikini or briefs or whatever through the, you know, your skirt. Uh, too sheer is the fourth way. So too low, too uh, uh, tight, thank you, too short or too sheer are four ways, four ways, four things that would cause the things you wear to draw the attention, a wrong attention of a man. Let's um, turn that off. Is that the last one? It is, isn't it? Oh, I forgot her. Um, her posture would probably not say, um, oh, we lost her. Anyway, her posture would not probably say I'm Okay, lights, please. Come on. I don't know how to do this. Oh, this is way too wrong, huh? Let me give you some scripture. I don't want you just to think I've given you my opinion. Matthew 5.28 says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Ladies, it is our responsibility to make sure that we help a man keep a pure mind. It is a known fact that men are very attracted to a lady's body. And if we know a man is very attracted to our body, we should avoid wearing clothing that draws attention to any certain part of our body. If we love our neighbor as ourself, a godly lady cares about the men that she's around. A godly lady cares about men being pure. And a godly lady doesn't let the fashion malls tell her, wear it low, wear it tight, because you'll attract the attention of men. I have an article here. I only half of it. I don't know what happened to the other half. Oh. This is a fashion magazine. I do not read fashion magazines to find out how I ought to dress. But I did want to get one to have some things documented. Um, this is a this is on ways to make you to look how to be body proud was the name of this article, and one of the things it said is that if you have an athletic fit, that means you don't have a lot of shape. What you need to do is wear a cinched waist and play up your bust line. So low cut necklines, push up bras, and wear a cinched waist, and then the guys won't know that that you're straight. He'll have he'll pay so much attention to your bust line, he won't care about the rest. Another article said, um, if you are very curvy, it says the worst thing you can do is to think that because you're curvy, you ought to cover up, be rebellious, and show off your sexy shape. The people who create clothing are not godly Christian people who are trying to keep us pure. The people who create clothing are people who don't think it's wrong for a man to lust after a woman. In fact, they're teach the women of the world think that the more power, the more sexy you are, the more power you have over men. And they love it. They love having that power. I think we're supposed to be different. I think we're supposed to re I rebel against that. I want, uh, I want Southern California ladies to realize that we don't put on our bikinis and go to the beach. I mean, if that stuff was a modest canoe, imagine what I think about bikinis or what a man would do with a bikini. Let me tell you a story, and I'm not proud of this story, but I'm going to tell it. I know there are ladies sitting here that you, this, you're like, I never heard this before in my life. I never heard it before in my life either. I grew up in, not in a Christian home. I grew up in a public school. And I didn't know anything about modesty. As a young girl, I, w I was a very clean girl. I didn't know anything about what men thought or what guys thought. Um, I, did, I didn't know. 
And I, I will tell you something, because it's my husband, I'm glad it's my husband that, that was with me at that time. He wasn't my husband then, but he is now. But we were on, a, a bunch of us kids went on a bike ride um, to go swimming. And um, I, we had no public pool, so most of my friends I had never been in a swimming with, because we, I grew up in a mountain community, a small town, and we're kind of backwoods. But we were all going to this uh, creek, and there was a swimming hole to go swimming. So we all rode our bikes. There's probably about 15 of us teenagers and some college-age people. And I wasn't dating my husband at the time, um, and I wasn't in church much at that, at that time. I just started going to church, but the church I was in hadn't taught me any. They would have never taught me standards or convictions or any of this. The, the preachers really avoided these scriptures. Um, they don't want to get the women mad at him at the church. But um, my, my husband said, he told me this, he said, um, when we got there, of course, you, well, we had our swimsuits under our clothes. So when we got there, we just took our clothes off to go swimming because we had swimsuits on. Well, my swimsuit covered less than my underwear. I had a very bikini bikini, like just a string here. And my husband said when I pulled off my shirt, he could not, he just about fainted. Now, I'm not proud of that story, but ladies, we affect men by how we dress. Now, I don't wear bikinis anymore. People would faint for other reasons if I did. But <laughs> and I didn't know better. But you know what? When I started studying my Bible, and I did learn about how men thought, I thought, I cannot be, I cannot have a clear conscience if I really love my neighbor as myself, I cannot dress in a way that would cause a man to have to struggle to keep his thought life pure. I can't dress in a way that would make a man who could care less about his thought life being pure lusting all the time. And some of you ladies may say, well, you know, I am really not that great to look at. You know, if I put on a pair of jeans, I don't look like those ladies, so no one's going to care. Well, what you do is you're an example to the girls who would look cute in a pair of jeans. So because you wear them, they wear them. And men do lust after them when they walk down the street. Huh, 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 you know, they... <laughs> Same thing with a tight skirt, and I didn't get into that. First Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Adultery is an evil thing. God hates adultery. We need to help men keep their minds clean. But understand that we need to be pure in our actions in our words, and in our appearance. And I don't condemn anyone if some of these areas aren't all right in your life. Everyone has to start growing. It took me two years to get, uh, to get straight on some of this stuff. And I'm str I struggle with it every day. You know how you're putting something on, you think, you know, this might be just a, you know how we gain weight and we lose weight and all that stuff? It's usually not the losing weight that's a problem, it's the gaining weight that's a problem. And I'm always, always checking and always caring. The best thing you can have is a full-length mirror in your house and check. And, and check. Get a friend who has the same goal as you do and check each other. And um, don't get this rebellious thing about, no one's going to tell me how to dress and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Just think about, do you really care about people? Do you really care about helping promote purity in these young girls? What kind of example are you? Who's following you? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. I, I just know that, I do know there's ladies in this room that um, maybe they've messed up on everything I've said today. Help them to know that there's ne it's never too late to start. Your mercies are new every morning. Help us to start using discretion in how we act. Help us to start using discretion in how we talk and how we look. And Lord, I pray for the ladies in here that, that maybe have not messed up, that they would have compassion and love on people who have and, and try to be helpful and never hurtful or judgmental. Just help us, Lord, to be pure and to promote purity in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.